Hey, if you have uh, your Bible with you, would you turn to Isaiah 55, 6 to 13? If you don't have your Bible, you can grab a pew Bible in front of you and you get the cheat code, which is page 1148 for those of us who want to turn there quickly. As you're doing that, I want to introduce um, our guest preacher for today. Uh, We've invited Heather Rice to come speak this morning. She is the director of the Whosoever Gospel Mission, a organization in Philadelphia that focuses on helping men who are experiencing homelessness uh, get resources they need and get help where needed. And um, I'm really grateful that she's here and excited for her. I know many of you have heard her speak before and are excited as well. And she's going to be preaching out of Isaiah 55, verses 6 to 13. And I'm going to read the right now as our teaching text for today, if you want to follow along. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn thorn bush will grow the pine tree, and instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Can we welcome Heather up here with a clap? clap. Thank you, Justin, and good morning, Leverington. It is a pleasure to be with you today. I've missed you all. It's been about a year, I think, and everybody just looks a year older, but you still look great. Um, I just want to bring you greetings from Whosoever Gospel Mission. Thank you so much for your ongoing support and partnership in the gospel. I also bring you greetings from Bob Emberger, our director emeritus, who uh, had to step down for health reasons, but he still serves with us in a vital capacity doing grant writing and fundraising, and he specifically wanted me to share his love and thanks and greetings with you today as well. I want to thank you for your support. You support us financially. You do Undy Sunday. You uh, do all kinds of things for us. You, you give us Pam as a tutor, so you, you let her out, and we're grateful for that. <laughs> um, but uh, you guys have just been a vital part of our ministry at the mission. And so just to kind of bring you in on that, as Justin shared, we have a residential program for men experiencing homelessness. It's a comprehensive Christ-centered long-term job readiness and addiction recovery program. And just to, to kind of summarize it in a story, there's a young man we have with us now, Chris. If you were to meet him, you think he looks 16. He does. He just turned 24. Um, but he, he is a kid. When we pass chocolate around, and it, it, he, he passes by because he says it makes him break out. So he's still very much a kid, right? Um, well, he got to the careers phase part of the program where now he's got less programming around the mission, but he is focused on looking for work outside of the mission. Well, we had a job opening in our thrift store, so we hired Chris because he, he's just this phenomenal young man. Well, we had our staff appreciation dinner in Peddler's Village up at the Cock and Bowl. We get a room. We have their lovely buffet, all the pretty Christmas lights. We have Christmas carols, and we play silly games, and it's, it's wonderful. And so every staff member gets to bring a guest. Well, Chris brought his mom, right? This is the email I got from Chris's mom the next morning. The subject line is gratitude. I would like to thank you again for making me a part of your staff celebration last night. It was wonderful. Everyone there are stepping stones used by God in the lives of the men to guide them on their journey. You have done so much for Christopher, it's truly overwhelming. Nine months ago, a child stood before me saying that he didn't believe in God. Today, He stands before me as a responsible, kind, loving, and faithful man of God. I prayed for him to find his way, and the Lord put all of you in his path. I am forever grateful for the unconditional love that he gets at the mission. All of you are truly doing God's work. Patty Everhard. Now, the cool thing is, that was was December 7th, December 8th. 
just this week, Chris had to change his days off so that he and his sister could go pick up his brother, take him to lunch, and check him in at Kirkbride so that he could get treatment. And it was Chris doing well and, and walking with the Lord and being in recovery that encouraged DJ to do it. Not only that, a month ago, Chris's dad checked into rehab because he was proud of what he was seeing in Chris's life. So the, 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 the relationships that our guys have and your investment in their lives, it doesn't just impact them, it impacts whole families. And the ripples that go out from there are innumerable. We'll never know them this side of glory. But that's your ministry. So as you, as you think of the mission, pray not just for an organization. Do, do that. We need that. But pray for individuals. Pray for men. Pray for their families. We just had our big toy giveaway where we turned our chapel into a toy store. Pam, you've seen it before. I think you've seen it, Jeff. I don't know. And um, it, we had, I mean, thousands of toys all over the chapel. And our guys come through and they shop. They don't pay anything. But they sign up their kids and their grandkids and they pick what they want to give to their kids and their grandkids. So no kid gets a toy from the Whosoever Gospel Mission. They get a gift from dad or pop or whoever it is. And we help them wrap it up. Father wrap is very unique and interesting and creative. But we, we help with that. We got lots of volunteers who help with that. But this year we um, were able to provide 12, about 1,200 toys for 256 kids. And actually more than that, because there were several stragglers that came after that. But that's when I stopped counting. So pray, you know, for those family relationships as, as kids play with those toys. And they think about their dad and the Lord's working in their dad's life. And God is bringing them and, you know, restoring families and bringing them back together. So just keep that in prayer. As you think of the mission, think of individuals. Think of men and their families, their kids, their grandkids, their parents, their siblings. Um, because your ministry impacts all of them. Well, let's, let's look to the word, um, and uh, I would like to just pray first. Father, would you settle our hearts and minds? Would you call us to be still and quiet before you? Lord, you promised that you will fill us with your spirit, and so we ask that you would do just that. Fill us with your spirit. Would you give us understanding? Write these words on our hearts. It wouldn't just be information, but you would transform us from the inside out. And now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer, all because of the risen Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You know, I love this passage in Isaiah. It's very picturesque. God like delights in using word pictures to paint you know, truth and knowledge for us. And this picture of snow falling gently and watering the earth, like as it melts and just seeps into the earth, that that water is not going to return to the heavens without accomplishing what God sent it to do. And he says, so is my word. My word cannot return to me without first accomplishing what I sent it to do. Now, what are words? Think about words for a second. Why do they even exist? Words exist to communicate, right? To, to put, to put a, a designation on an idea so that you can have the same idea that I have, right? It's so that we can think about the same thing. We can understand the same thing. It's an interpersonal kind of thing. Who created words? Well, God created words, right? <laughs> now, words exist to communicate. God gives us his word to communicate to us, to communicate himself, his heart, all that he is, all that he wants us to know. And so over the millennium, he has sent us words, prophets and people to write down his messages to us. Problem is we, we haven't received it well, we haven't understood it well, we haven't followed it well. So in the last days, he sent us a final word. The word whose name is Jesus, the word made flesh. I want to fast forward for a moment and look at that word. We've just come through Christmas. It's still the Christmas season, you know. It's, we're actually in Christmas right now. You know, Advent happened up until Christmas, and now we're in Christmas, right? And so if we think about the Christmas story, think about how it starts in Luke. It starts with this faithful priest, Zachariah, and his old wife, Elizabeth. They're both old, right? Zachariah and Elizabeth, they're an old couple. 
And Zechariah is a priest, and they're faithful. They, they honor the Lord. They've walked with the Lord all their lives. And he is serving in the temple. It's his turn. He's on shift, on duty. And he draws the, the, the straw to, to go in and burn incense this day. So he's in at the hour of incense, burning incense inside the temple, while everyone else is outside praying. And while he's in there, who shows up but Gabriel, right? Now, it's been 400 years of silence as far as new messages from the Lord, right? No prophets, no angels, no messages, no visions, no dreams. It's been quiet for 400 years. Now think about that. We're in America where we think old history is like 200 years ago, right? You go to Europe and they're like, oh, it's just a 200-year-old house. It's not worth looking at, right? But here we're like, wow, it's, that's a 200-year-old building. And we put up a marker and it's very cool. 400 years ago. My math is terrible, you can do the math, but I mean like it was a long time ago here, right? You're talking 16-ish hundreds, right? You don't know anybody who was alive then. You don't even know anybody who knows anybody who was alive then. That's ancient history to us, right? Zechariah doesn't know anybody who knew anybody who was alive the last time there was a word from the Lord. Him believing the Bible is as distant and it's the same kind of experience as us believing the Bible right? It's a word of God in history from the past. And so here he is in the temple serving and Gabriel, the angel of the Lord stands there and talks to him, calls him by name, Zachariah. Zachariah is terrified, understandably. And Gabriel tells him, don't be afraid, Zachariah. The Lord has heard your prayer and your wife, Elizabeth, he also knows her name. So he's named them both. Clearly he's got the right guy. He knows who he's talking to, and he knows what he's talking about. He says, the Lord has heard your prayer, Zechariah, and your wife, Elizabeth, is going to conceive a son in her old age. Now, this is a pivotal moment in Zechariah's life, right? What does he do with this information? There's an angel of the Lord standing before him. This has never happened before. His answer is, how can I be sure? Like, are you serious? (laughs) Not like wow, what was me or anything like that? Like it's, how, how can I, how can I believe you? I love Gabriel's answer. I am Gabriel and I stand in the presence of God. <laughs> and basically he has sent me with this message to you. Uh, but since you don't believe it, you're going to be silent for nine months. <laughs> in other words, no more words for you. Be still, be quiet while you chew on this word from God for nine months until this baby is born and you speak again. How can I be sure? That's that's his response. Now think about Gabriel's answer for a second. I am Gabriel and I stand in the presence of God. Who is Zechariah? He's Zechariah and he stands literally at this moment in the shadow of the representation of God's presence with his people. He's standing in the temple, the temple that was built and designed to remind people that God, Emmanuel, dwells with them. So Zechariah the priest has to go through the motions of of, of perpetuating the shadow day in and day out of what it looks like for God to dwell with his people through the sacrificial system and through the burning of incense and through the offering of prayers and all of the things that God has set up to remind Israel that their sin has separated them from God, but that God is a redeeming God, slow to anger and abounding in love, the God who delights in saving and coming to redeem them, the one who will send the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the suffering servant, the one who's going to come and fix everything that went wrong. He is representing the people to God and God to the people in the shadow. And here's Gabriel who says, I I don't stand and serve in the shadow. I stand in the throne room of heaven, the same throne room we get a glimpse of in Isaiah chapter six, because John tells us that Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus when he saw God high and lifted up on that throne. So Gabriel, who stands in the actual presence of God. So who is it that would have sent Gabriel with this message? It's the Lord himself. So how can you know? Because God said so. The same Gabriel goes not six months later to a young woman in Nazareth, to Mary. And he speaks to her and she's also terrified. And he says, Mary, don't be afraid. You have found favor with God. And and Gabriel goes on to tell her how she is going to bear this redeemer, this promised one, the Messiah, the one who will be the savior of the world. The one that John tells us is the word made flesh who will dwell among us. 
And she doesn't say, how can I believe you? How can I know this is true? She says, let it be unto me according to your will. She just has a question. How will this be? Because I'm a virgin. She's not saying, how can I believe you? She's trusting that this will be. I'm, I'm on board, she says. How do you want to do this? Because I've not been with a man. And she has no intention to because she's walking with the Lord. And that's a different answer, right? The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the child who is born of you will be conceived by the Holy Ghost. It will be, and so he will be called the Son of God. It's a totally different question. And in Gabriel's answer, he goes on to say, By the way, your relative Elizabeth, she's also with child. She's in her sixth month. She who was barren will bear a child. And then Gabriel says in his closing comment, For no word of the Lord will ever fail. No word of the Lord will ever fail. What if? We actually believed that. What would life be like if we actually believed Gabriel's words? Gabriel, who is the servant of the Lord, the sent one from God with the messages, the one who stands and serves in the throne room itself, who knows from the perspective of history and from the, the engagement itself with God, in the, the one who is holy and righteous and true, the one who, who has spoken the world into existence and has spoken prophecy after prophecy and encouragement and promise and word after word. And Gabriel can testify to the fact that none of them ever fail. They're all true and they will be completed just as God said they would. What would it look like in my life and in yours if we did a Mary and not a Zechariah? Now, what, what, what do we mean by that? Well, we're usually pretty good at believing the promises of God when things feel settled and okay. It's when life falls apart, when our, our peace and our confidence is threatened, that we begin to fret and turn inward and despair and find ourselves worrying and doing all the things that don't exactly line up with the, the life of peace that the Lord tells us we should expect if we're in Christ, right? Now, we generally say, oh, I'm a, I'm a forgiving person. I'm a calm person. I'm a joyful person. But then, you know, it, then we have the, 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 but this is, and we explain why in this moment we're not joyful, calm, or peaceful. We say, but this is different. This thing is going on. The situation is happening. And so as though that situation explains our, our angst, our anger, our upset, our, our underlying low-level, like, eroding uh, just anxiousness. So let's back up for a minute and look at what this is what I call the garbage disposal rule. This is a rule I learned at the mission. It's a spiritual law. It's one of, it's like there's, you know, we used to say there's four spiritual laws, there's five. The fifth one is, is not always understood. It's the garbage disposal rule. So at the mission, you know, we serve 55 men every day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so we have a commercial garbage disposal, right? And it's sharp, obviously, because it's a garbage disposal, right? So we have signs all over the kitchen. Now we, we train men in the program to work in the kitchen and to, to do various tasks. And so... There's a sign all around the garbage disposal, multiple signs that say, do not put your hand in the garbage disposal drain under any circumstances, right? There's also signs that say, don't put raw carrots and hard roots and, you know, things down here. Also a sign that says, you know, don't put, you know, unexpanded oats and things like that that will swell and clog things up. But lots of signs, big red, you know, like circle cross out, do not put your hand in here, right? It's very clear. You cannot miss the signs. So one morning... I park out back because there's no parking in the front and I come in through the kitchen door. So I'm coming in for chapel. It's like a little before 8 a.m. And there's a guy, the, the head chef of the day, at the kitchen door waiting for me. I come to he goes, oh, thank God you're here. So-and-so's bleeding. So I go over to so-and-so. You figure out that he's not going to die and he doesn't need stitches. We can wash it out, butterfly. It's all good. And so then the natural question is, what happened? Well, I, I had to put my hand down the garbage disposal. I was like, wait a second. Did you not see the signs? And his answer will stick with me for the rest of my life. Oh no, Miss Heather, I saw the signs. It's just that I dropped a spoon down there and I had to get it out. I said, wait a second. I didn't make the signs because I was afraid on a good day when it was functioning smoothly, you would have this urge to plunge your hand down inside the garbage disposal for fun. 
The only time I even conceived of you wanting to put your hand down there was when it jammed. Like, why else, when else would you be compelled to do that? And he said, well, I didn't think about that. I said, clearly. There's no reason for the sign to come into play when everything's functioning smoothly because you don't want to put your hand down the garbage disposal drain. It's just gross in every way imaginable. But when you feel the need, when you feel like I have to do this because I have a problem, a situation that must be addressed, and I know the rules, I know the signs, I know the, the warnings and the commands and the truth that's posted all over the wall in front of my face, but this is different, this is an exception. I have a problem, I need to fix it. I must put my hand down that drain, never mind that there's sharp blades and all kinds of gross things that can infect whatever you cut down there, right? Never mind any of that. It's stuck, I need to get it out. I tell this guy, the sign only comes into play when you feel the essential need to actually violate it. Until then, the sign is not even relevant. It doesn't matter. It's, you, you don't get credit for obeying the sign when it's functioning properly. The sign, your opportunity to obey the sign is when everything inside of you needs to disobey it. That's when you actually get to practice obeying the rule. That is the garbage disposal rule. Now, what does that mean spiritually? It means just because you don't hold grudges against people, but then this person, oh, they did you dirty and they sinned against you and now you're really struggling with anger and you can't forgive them. You don't get credit for being a forgiving person for all those other days. This is your first opportunity to actually forgive. And friends, this is what it feels like. This is what Jesus is calling you to. This is what he's asking you to do, to actually forgive this offense. There's nothing to forgive if there's no offense. If it doesn't hurt, you don't need to forgive. This is when the rule comes into play. This is when you get to demonstrate what it is to take up your cross and follow Jesus. So where's the word of God that doesn't fail in the midst of this? The word of God that doesn't fail is the one that says, you who are forgiven in Christ, you who have been redeemed, who have been called out of darkness into light, you who know what it is to be forgiven by the Father, who are you to not forgive the lesser offenses of those who have sinned against you? And so Jesus tells it in a story about the parable of the unforgiving servant. And we, we laugh with scorn at the, the servant who was forgiven this incomprehensible debt who then has to throw his, his fellow man in prison because he can't pay off a tiny pittance. We laugh at him and then we hold a grudge. But the word of God, no word of God can ever fail. And when the Lord says, you want to enjoy my forgiveness, you want to enjoy my peace, you need to forgive even as you've been forgiven. Well, what about the word that says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you? So the ones you get to carry, but, but you don't understand, my, my kid isn't walking with the Lord. My kid is doing this. I, I, have to, I have to be anxious over this. Well, who loves him more, you or the Lord? Who is the one who can actually whisper truth in his ear and change his heart and soften it and melt it and draw him to himself? Well, the Lord can. So why not cast that burden on the feet of the Lord and pray and offer your kid up to the Lord and you walk in the joy and peace of the Spirit because you know that your son belongs to God and not to you. Those are not easy things. But those are the things that the Lord gifts to us when we actually choose to believe that the word of God will never fail, that no word of God can ever fail. You see, what is it that the Lord offers us? He doesn't just offer us this freedom from ultimate damnation at the end of our days when we, you know, have to stand and face Jesus face to face after we die. It's not like salvation starts at death. What he's offering us is life right now. And if you don't feel like your life is characterized by peace and joy as you walk in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, as you, as you rest in, in green pastures and drink at still waters, as you, as you find peace and joy and, and you are fearless even in the face of the, the shadow of death because you're being led by Emmanuel, the God who is with you, the shepherd who goes before you, whose rod and whose staff comfort you, if that doesn't describe your life, then the Lord is not asking you to feel guilty and horrible about it. He's asking you to come and find rest and find peace because his word actually works. He, he only speaks what is true. And he knows what it is when he says in the midst of suffering, in the midst of hard things, he still is calling us to rejoice, not as some masochistic fools, but as people, as daughters, as sons who find that when you are in Christ 
and you begin to experience the fellowship of his sufferings, the mystery of the presence and union we have with Christ and in Christ is incomprehensible to the world. That's why it's called a peace that passes understanding because the world cannot understand it. But you know that the word of God cannot fail so you are not an orphan and you're not lost and you do have everything you need for life and for godliness because Peter couldn't have been wrong when he said it in his letter. So what would your life look like if you actually believed that no word of the Lord could ever fail? I think it might be quieter. There might be more rest doesn't mean it's wrong to feel fear. It's just when you do feel it, you listen to the command of the Lord that says, fear not, don't fear. Don't do fear. Don't feed it. Don't listen to it. Don't let it consume you. That Zechariah that we talked about earlier, he finally got to speak in the end of chapter one of, of Luke because his baby, John, is born and the town want to name this baby after Zechariah or someone else in their family. And he can finally speak after he writes down that, no, his name is John. And the words that he speaks are a song of the spirit that the spirit of God fills him with. And he prophesies first about Jesus and then about his son, John. And about Jesus, he says that this child is born in fulfillment of the promise that God made to our fathers, Abraham, and, and to Isaac, and to Jacob, that this promise is that God would free us from our enemies and the hand of all who hate us so that we could serve God without fear in righteousness and holiness all our days. That this child, Jesus, comes to free us from fear that we could serve God fearlessly. Every last enemy, he says, he comes to free us from. Enemies without and enemies within. What would it look like for you this year to be able to serve God without fear? Without fear of what is or what will happen? Without fear of what people think of you or what they'll say? Without fear of what might happen? Because you know that whatever does happen, none of it is by accident. The Lord is in control of everything. So when your vacation plans get tanked because your mom has to go to the hospital or because you got sick or because it rained or whatever happened... That the Lord, the sovereign Lord, the one who created all things is the one who loves you and is calling you to walk with him today, wherever that is. And so you can have joy and rest in him and thank him for the moment, wherever he leads you. Imagine what that kind of joy would feel like. That when your water heater bursts, you're not even upset. You're like, well, this is interesting. What are we doing today, Lord? <laughs> but you are with me and you are good. It literally changes everything. So what if tested God in a good way? What if we tasted and saw that he really is good? How blessed is the one who takes refuge in him? My friends, let's pray. Oh, Father, forgive us for doubting your word, your word that says your grace is sufficient for us, that your strength is made perfect in our weakness, that you who know what it is to be falsely accused and to to suffer for our sake. You, the word made flesh, who has not returned to heaven without first accomplishing what it is you were sent to accomplish, our very salvation, our freedom from sin and from death. You who are the living word, the one who is the bread of life, who feeds us the living water, who refreshes our soul in the dry and thirsty desert, the one who is the resurrection and the life who takes our death and swallows it up from the inside out that we might have life. Jesus, you are the living word and we worship you. We ask you to open our eyes and soften our hearts that as we find life in your name alone, we would believe you. We would believe you at your word, your word that says there is no condemnation now for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. For you have fixed it. The law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death because what the law was powerless to do as it was weakened by the flesh, you have done, Father, by sending your own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin so that we who walk in the spirit will no longer be slaves to sin, but we instead get to cry out to you, Abba, Father. Would you fill us with your spirit? 
And would you take these groanings of our flesh and would you sanctify them and weave them together even as you promise for your glory and for our good? Because you who reign over everything know what it is to suffer and you declare with power who and what could possibly separate us from your love. Could tribulation or trouble or nakedness or famine or sword? No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through you who loved us. Father, help us to trust and believe and rest in your love. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today as we strive to think carefully about our faith. You can help keep this ministry on the air by making a donation at leverington.org. For now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. We'll see you next time.